Well, thank you, Matthew. Um, that was certainly worth waiting for. Thank you. <laughs> Um, lots in that. Um, just for the benefit of the audience, um, I get the opportunity to ask a few questions here. We'll turn to you uh, for questions <coughs> in a moment. I will err on the side of giving you all plenty of time um, to ask lots of questions based on everything that's been announced and talked about today, because there is a lot in that. Um, but let me kick off. Um, Matthew, when we were sitting down uh, around lunch, we were, we were talking about some research that CEDA had done earlier this year uh, where we um, polled uh, the community on attitudes to economic growth uh, and to um, the priorities, and polled them around the priorities for economic development. And you referenced Australia's fantastic track record, 27 years of sustained economic growth. And the really interesting thing from our survey, um, which probably won't surprise some, was that the majority of people felt that they hadn't benefited or didn't know if they'd benefited from this record run of economic growth. And I'm interested in why you think that's the case. Uh, and you've touched on some things that I think go to, you know, how we better connect them to growth. But if you wouldn't mind just sort of saying what you think are the key issues to connecting them to growth. It's a very good question. It was an interesting discussion because we were saying, you look at the growth of Australia sustained for literally 27 years. And in fact, running up, uh, coming here today, I, I ran into Peter Costello in Flinders Lane. <laughs> And uh, many uh, of the decisions in which we're benefiting from today economically uh, arose in his time as treasurer. Um, we haven't been good at communicating the message as to how economic growth has had a huge and dramatic effect on our lifestyle and why Australia has been such a successful country in the last 20 or 30 years, both in terms of uh, our harmonious nature as a country, in terms of healthcare, <coughs> excuse me, except for my own, um, and the fact, as I said to you, we saw a sort of research the other day saying that I think it's cervical cancer will be all but a thing of the past in Australia in, in 20 years, which is something that as a successful country with a successful economy we can invest in. We can invest in healthcare in a way that we never would have thought possible in our parents' generation, in our grandparents' generation, many other parts of the world can't do. But when we can get to that level of... Uh, healthcare that is giving us one of, nowadays in some cases, if not the longest lifespans in the world, we should be proud of this, we should be talking about this, that we don't connect our successful economy and the structures of it and the institutions that have underpinned it to that level of success, I think is an issue for all of us. And one of the things I, I said at, at, at the table for the whole room's benefit, you know, my, <clears throat> my children can come home and tell me a lot about um, the world around them, the environment around them. And that's important, and I acknowledge it's very, very important. But one of my sons asked me about World War II the other day and didn't know a thing about World War II. He's nine. Who, who was this person? Who was that person? The fact that we are not teaching our children how we got to the stage we're at, it is important to teach about our country's history, about world history, about why Australia is the country that it is today. Why we bought so many, why so many people came to Australia after World War II. Um, how long this country has been settled, 40, 50,000 years. Teach the history of this country and the world around them. And that, of course, is very important in next generations and people understanding what the rest of the world deals with in their, their lifestyle, their country, their fundamentals, to how strong Australia has been post-World War II, but particularly from the mid-90s onward. And we should be proud of it. We should talk a lot more about it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I think one of the other things that, that came out on the key issues that you were flagging as just front and centre for the election here in Victoria, um, of course, population, people are talking about it. Um, people are talking about population policies in a way that actually they haven't been for some time. Um, but of course, one of the areas where I think the uh, wider community is a little bit disillusioned um, is in the ability of different levels of government to work together. Um, and of course, population sits squarely in that in that space of requiring um, good communication, good cooperation, and coordination um, across federal and state governments. How do you see your structures, um, your plans, and your commission, you know, working with um, the, the federal level of government? And and what degree of confidence have you got that you can actually make that work for the long term in the way uh, you think it needs to? Um, we have to try something different. We, we can't be content with what we're doing being the answer to managing the 
population growth that we're going through. And so therefore the establishment of a population commission in a similar way to Infrastructure Victoria mm -hmm. is about having the direction, the answers and a public organisation that is presenting what needs to be put forward to manage sustainable growth. So when we're rolling out precinct structure plans, for instance, what is going to be necessary at the time of development? So when we're looking at growing Warrigal Druin, for instance, uh, where are instances of areas that can grow, other areas that can provide greater density? The same with Geelong. We need to have a commission that is providing answers and indeed uh, some of those questions I said about the review around taxation. You know, is it a three-tiered payroll tax system that says zero payroll tax outside of uh, in-country Victoria. I don't know. But what are those incentives that we need to provide to start to grow the whole of the state? And nothing worthwhile, as I said, nothing worthwhile is easy. Mm. But we need to do something different because how we're growing the state is a dated way of how we're doing business. And I don't see any change in the structure of government in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of the bodies who keep in their own silos and occasionally mix because they've got the same departmental secretary, but then they have their own depsecs who talk to themselves and don't talk to each other. And We need to do something different. We don't have an overarching whole of government body talking about population, about the kind of Victoria that we want to be in 2050, 2060, 2070, then we'll repeat the same mistakes that we've repeated in the last 20 years for the next 20 and 30. So now I get to turn uh, to the audience. Um, if you've got a question, we've got microphones in the room. If you'd like to raise your hand and, of course, as always, uh, introduce yourself and where you're from, then that uh, assists Matthew in answering. All right, I'll let you, I'll let you ponder that for a moment. Uh, oh, sorry, just over here, thanks. I thought that was one of my colleagues going to ask a question <laughs> of me. Um, Grant Poulter from Cricket Australia. Is that working? Um, my question is in regards to community sport uh, across the state. More than 426,000 Victorians play cricket, um, yet many are playing uh, in facilities that are old and tired, um, and particularly for the more than 100,000 uh, women and girls who play cricket, um, the facilities just don't cater for a, a rapidly expanding participant base. Um, what's the opposition's view in regards to um, community sporting facilities, particularly for cricket, but also acknowledging the important role that um, community cricket clubs play in regional Victoria in particular? It's a good question. I, I think uh, David Southwick is here, and David and I were just announcing uh, opening up uh, Caulfield Park. Uh, so is Tim Smith, the Shadow Education Minister, I think he was also announcing some sporting fields just uh, yesterday as well. And uh, the main point of this is to make sure that we have the sporting facilities in place in what is the greatest uh, areas of greatest need, and that is particularly in middle suburbs and country and regional Victoria, where they haven't been provided any pools of funds, if you like, to actually upgrade existing facilities, particularly now with the, uh, with the huge growth in women's sport and girls coming to sport. We want them to play sport. We want to get them out of the house. You know, I've got kids who are nine, seven and five. If I gave them an iPhone or iPad all day, they'd sit inside and wouldn't leave the house. But I want them outside. Well, they won't go out, particularly the girls in sport, won't go and play if they haven't got the facilities. Now, while I don't want to attack the AFL, it's not their fault. The government has given the AFL a huge, I think it's a huge benefit, quarter of a billion dollars to, uh, to upgrade Eddie Had and, and uh, money for their new headquarters. And while they put a lot of money into community sport, I understand that, the role of government is to focus on the priority need at the point in time, and that is community sport now. Because we've got huge population pressures that are putting great growth on existing infrastructure. And in my area, and my seat is Doncaster, Bulleen, Templestowe, literally all of the clubs in those areas cannot cater for girls playing footy or cricket because they don't have the club rooms. Girls are getting changed in disabled toilets, in the car, getting changed at home and just coming to and then having to go back and forth. If you don't provide the infrastructure, if you say, well, we've got $10 million as a state fund to put in new change rooms, that is not enough. That's why we've said we wanted to focus that money not to the major sporting bodies, you know, they are multi-billion dollar businesses, they can manage on themselves for a couple of years, but at this point in time, the greatest need is community sport. And it is the greatest need because we've got a lot more girls coming in and with population growth, boys teams as well. Well, that's good news. That's a problem you want to have because you want kids playing sport. Well, we've got to provide as governments the answer to it because local government can't do it by themselves at all. That's got to be a state solution. That's why we'd said, use state monies, not for big codes, but for local sporting grassroots. So, Matthew, I'm happy with that response. I'm really pleased about that. But can I encourage you not to spend any more money on 
basketball facilities in Bulleen uh, because the girls' teams are competitive enough already <laughs> up there. <laughs> Have we got... Uh, the boys' uh, teams aren't. My sons are on it. <laughs> <laughs> got a question over here. Thank you. Matthew, uh, Nick Barr from uh, Nico Communications. Look, a question I've got is about investment attraction. I mean, Melbourne is getting very big and um, it may or may not get to eight million, but I don't actually see a lot of sort of corporate um, and big corporate announcement here, big business or small business for that matter, moving here. Um, have you got any concerns about uh, employment in the future with a city so large? And uh, have you got any plans to compete with Sydney, which I think still is, frankly, attracting um, more and more corporate HQs. Uh, Nick, one of the things when I was in Israel about 15 months ago with David Southwick, one of the things we uh, looked at and learnt was how Israel is very good at targeting what they want in their country and what they want to invest in. And rather than a <coughs> kind of a sh shotgun approach to one here, one here, one here, one here, they'll target what they want, go after it and finally get it, bring it back and then move on to the next. Very targeted investment strategies which work have worked very, very well and then backing that up by investing and supporting local industries that can then match the uh, externals uh, that have come over and indeed invested in their country. So it was a very, very interesting strategy and, and way they do business in Israel. And that is something I know David and myself will soon release policy around because it is something I think Victoria can do better. Now, when I see us as a state targeting India and looking at India and saying, we're going to go to... Punjab, we're going to go to Gujarat, we're going to go to Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, and do all of this. It's a country of one and a half billion people. To be so scattergun in its approach as to, you know, is it aerospace? <coughs> Excuse me, it might be healthcare, uh, whatever it might be. We need to have a targeted strategy about why we're going to those countries, why we're seeking international investment, and where we want it to go. If we're seeking uh, financial sector jobs, as I said before, is part of that narrative to say, and we request that if you come here, we'll give you an incentive to put part of those jobs in our regional financial capital. If we're seeking renewables investment, and we ask that you invest in our renewables capital in the country, which is Portland, or whatever it might be, to actually have a whole of state strategy that is targeted and specific. As I said, Israel does it very, very well. It was a great strategy that David and I got some information, quite a bit of policy on. It's one we'd like to bring to government. Matthew, can I, can I just ask a follow-up question on that? I mean, I think um, it's maybe an area where Australia hasn't done so well in the past um, in this idea of sort of, uh, you know, the way economists will refer to it, sort of picking winners or picking the future. I mean, what gives you confidence that, um, that we can do that differently uh, in the, than we have in the past? Look, Melbourne is a stable international market that has, uh, has a very broad economic base and the broad economic fundamentals, uh, and as a consequence, uh, it, people see it as a stable and safe place to invest. One of the reasons I talk a lot about law and order and people wonder, you know, what are you doing it for this, what are you doing it for that, apart from the obvious, which is around the safety of our population, it's also about our brand. It's also about our brand as a city overseas. If people believe Melbourne is an unsafe destination, not only will they not come as a tourist, they won't invest. They won't come here to be educated. They'll go to Sydney or Brisbane. So it's about our city, the reality of our uh, issues around law and order and our brand as a city. You know, we can't just rely on it and be complacent about Melbourne as a brand. We have to strengthen it, invest in it and focus on what people see as us as a city overseas and what we need to secure in people then investing in that brand. And so I'm confident that we can do that. And in the next... And, you know, this century should be Melbourne's century, Victoria's century in Australia... People don't worry about climate, uh, as in, uh, you know, Brisbane's climate compared to Melbourne's climate, vice versa, or the, how pretty your harbour is. People want to know that your fundamentals are sound. And we need to make sure that our fundamentals are sound in this city and this state so that you've got a well-connected, um, uh, you know, 100 miles out of Melbourne where 86% of your population live, easily commutable, um, an international economy, multi-language, multi-skilled, that we can market to the world as a strong, dependable, reliable place to invest into the future. Uh, question at the back here. Thank you. <coughs> Good 
Good afternoon, Danny Addison from the Urban Development Institute. Matthew, you mentioned that the ABS has continuously under um, forecast for the population growth that we've experienced. Would a Guy government consider establishing a, a data centre of excellence or something along those lines that would be just purely and utterly dedicated to making sure that we uh, got it right and that that information was fed into where the decisions are being made? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, without second guessing the ABS, uh, Part of the role of the Population Commission with the Victoria in Futures document, which is our population expert, uh, population advice from the state government, is to make sure that we have predicted that accurately as much as we can in region by region and provide the land release, the uh, uh, zoning changes that will be necessity uh, necessitate the growth in existing urban areas or existing regional centres or activities areas, I should say, as well. But you're right, the ABS has fundamentally underestimated Melbourne's growth since 1997. When we went back into net interstate migration positive in September 97, it was considered a blip. We, we weren't, that wasn't going to be sustained. It sustained, went down, sustained, went down, went up to positive, down, and it's hovered negative, positive, negative, positive, but more into the positive for the last 10 or so years. We can't be a victim of our own success in that sense. That's why we need to plan for how we're going to grow the state. I don't want to turn the tap off and say, I don't want here, uh, I'm like Bob Carr saying the place is closed. Not at all. But we do need to manage this challenge. Uncontrolled population growth is not managing it, is allowing a free-for-all that will leave us with a lower standard of living and a lower level of livability than we currently experience. You know, we will not maintain a livable city for the next generation if... We, as I said before, thunder in an extra 2.4 million people on top of 5 million people in the next 20 to 25 years and do not much about it. Or that hope gets us through, you know, hope people change their transport habits, which they haven't in the last 30 years. Hope people move into certain activities areas, which they only have in a trickle for the last 30 years. We need to look at settlement patterns. We need to understand where those populations and demographics want to go and then find the incentives to give them a reason to go there. Health and transport are those two key reasons for people wanting to decentralise. It's why we've committed to upgrades or the commencing of upgrades in hospitals in Warrnambool, in Warrigal, in Swan Hill, in the rail upgrades I've just made last week and others that will come because we have to invest in the whole state rather than just focusing everything on Melbourne. Decentralisation helps Melbourne. You know, Melbourne's future can't be looking at it by itself. It needs to be looked at in the prism of the whole state and vice versa. Otherwise, as I said before, we'll grow a city-state that will not be either economically or socially, sociably sustainable for any of us. Well, while I'm waiting for uh, someone to come up with another question for you. Uh, let's turn to taxation. Um, you've talked about, uh, you know, potential tax incentives to uh, to get businesses to relocate and uh, as part of the decentralisation, which, of course, getting jobs um, in different locations is going to be fundamentally important. Um, we know most of the net job growth is actually happening, um, you know, literally within a kilometre of the CBD of Melbourne at the moment. So... Um, so how we think about getting jobs in different regions um, and or better connecting people to those jobs here is fundamentally important. But on tax, there's, there's another bit of tax review going on at the moment um, with the three letters GST. Um, how, how are you seeing that, that conversation and the policy around the redistribution of GST playing out? Is that something that's going to help or hinder you as you look at um, tax reform from a different lens? Without preempting the results of the review and without um, giving my shadow treasurer, who's at the back of the room, a heart, heart attack <laughs> as he looks at me, we've always said that we believe our state deserves its fair share. You know, we, go, we are going through a substantial population growth. We have been a net contributor, the only state to be a net contributor to, uh, to the Commonwealth since Federation. We're the only state to be a net contributor every year to the Commonwealth. So we are going through huge pressures and Victoria deserves its fair share. We've constantly said that and maintain that. Now, as I said, I don't want to preempt the review and I don't want to preempt uh, any of the discussions it might have, but it's obvious that uh, we can't tell people where to live. I don't expect Exxon or PwC or Ernst & Young to go and pack up and move to Turalgon or to Morwell. Uh, but we are. Find, we need to find ways to grow some of those local industries or indeed provide an incentive for medium businesses, medium-sized in particular, 
to do business outside of Melbourne in some of those areas. It might be Warrigal Druin, it might be Kilmore, it might be Balan, whatever it may be. Um, at the moment, our taxation structure doesn't provide any incentive. And as I said, I don't want to preempt it because I can't. I've, I've asked, I'm going to ask a group of people to do a job. I want them to come back and do that independently. But we do need to think differently about how our taxation system operates into the future. And that's Michael and I's rationale for looking at this and looking at this structure. And we hope that both the planning systems and taxation systems can be real incentive, incentives uh, to decentralisation. Just remember, a planning system is the greatest hindrance to economic development anywhere in the state, both your local and state planning systems. That's why when I was a Minister for Planning, uh, much to the uh, annoyance of my political opponents, you know, I saw it as an economic portfolio, not a social portfolio, not an academic portfolio. It's gone back to being an academic portfolio, arguing over, you know, uh, the shape of lamp the shape of light poles in growth areas, which is ridiculous. It's an economic portfolio that restricts growth. You are trying to facilitate jobs and facilitate growth. How do you use your systems to streamline or incentivise that growth? And so, um, as I said, taxation is one of those and so will the planning systems be. A uh, question over here, thanks. Yep. Hello, Matthew, how are you? Uh, Joe Gorsey here, Mayor of Bobo Shire, which is one of these highly um, active growth areas that you've been talking about down it there. Is. So we're only um, one hour out of Melbourne, but if your fast rail goes through, we'll be 45 minutes away from Melbourne. Our biggest pressure that we have here at the moment is that our growth rates, um, if you look at the uh, census figures, is about 2.4. But being a spine on the rail line, we've got areas that are up into the high threes on percentage growth. And infrastructure is our biggest problem going through there. Our major problem is that we're not linked into interface councils and yet our growth figures are higher than some of the interface councils around the CBD and we can't seem to get support for creating this infrastructure that creates jobs and growth and everything else going forward. So what's your government's thought process on that moving forward? Joe, you, you've absolutely, uh, as the last question, hit the nail on the head because that is precisely the reason why we've announced that we would... Um, uh, conclude all our precinct structure plans within the growth boundary by 30 June 2020 and have the VPA, the Victorian Planning Authority, then start to assist councils like yours to structure plan places like Warrigal Druin, which is going to be in the next five or ten years a larger metropolitan area than Taralgon, um, which is going to be a, a huge level of growth offset from a, a conclusion of growth in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, the southeastern suburbs and the growth corners in Casey Cardinia, which are then going to go out to Borbor, and as you say correctly, the levels of growth that you get, three now, probably five in the next few years, our councils don't have the resources to deal with it. Managing that kind of structure planning, let alone the infrastructure. You know, works in kind is one uh, suggestion, but of course, there is going to be a huge level of demand on educational services. Again, as Tim Smith and I have been out to see a number of um, schools in growth corridors, and of course, on health services and particularly in your demographic, which is younger families, early childhood services, which are overwhelmed. You know, we have committed, as you said, to the railway, to the hospital, uh, to start those, uh, well, both, both of those projects, and they'll take a, a bit more than a few years, obviously, but they are needed. I mean, you've now got people leaving the eastern burbs of Melbourne to come and have children in Warrigal, because it's easier and quicker to get there than it is to Cabrini, for instance, than it is to the Monash Medical Centre. So uh, the Warrigal, uh, Warrigal and Druin areas are sustaining huge level of growth. As I said, whether it's road, whether it's rail, whether it's health services, we're committed to decentralisation, we're committed to put in place the structures to assist those councils through the VPA, uh, the government structure through ministers and others, uh, and that will, I hope, deliver the infrastructure that will more sustainably manage that kind of growth because I think what you're experiencing is just the start not the mid-range, the start of the kind of growth that we're going to see in a place like Borbor over the next few years. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Matthew. It's been, um, a, a, you know, a jam-packed <laughs> presentation, I think, of the ideas that you've got for Victoria's future. Uh, it's been really interesting to me. I referenced this survey that um, CEDA did before. I talked about how people thought about economic growth, but we did also ask people about the issues that most mattered to them. Uh, in terms of their own um, personal well-being uh, and what they were looking for from economic development, uh, and it was a really clear message. Uh, many of the things that you've touched on today, um, basic health care, um, affordable quality essential services, um, affordable housing, uh, and reduced violence in home in the communities were consistently 
uh, among the top um, five issues that were raised. So I think you've hit on all of those. You've talked um, at length about population, which isn't surprising. Uh, given uh, the things that we read about every day, and it does seem to have really emerged uh, reasonably quickly as as an issue that's now gaining a lot of uh, a lot of focus. Um, can I wish you good luck over the next 46 days? I think you said. I do not envy you that. I have to say, I can't imagine uh, what that's like uh, in a day to day sense. But but good luck with that. Uh, and uh, at some stage in the future, we look forward to having you back on the Cedar stage. Thank you very much. If you can join me in thanking Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.